Uh, by day, I am a senior software engineer at DMSI, um, and I recently took on another role uh, to work as a practice leader. Um, and what that means is I like code and I like humans, and I'm trying to kind of blend those two things together. How do I get people um, thinking about technical problems in a way that's going to advance them, grow their talents, um, and also produce really, really strong business outcomes for us? So that's kind of my role there. Um, you'll notice a lot about me is about blending different domains. Um, so when I did my undergrad, uh, my undergrad was in computer science, uh, but I also tacked on minors in math, business, and cybersecurity because I guess I'm a masochist. Um, and uh, my journey uh, through that was really fun. I liked seeing how tech influenced a lot of different areas and vice versa. Um, I continued that uh, in my master's degree. So my master's degree is not like technical in a super strong like <clears throat> coding sense. Um, it was a master's in critical and creative thinking. I did a concentration in writing and critical reflection. And that gave me the chance to say, like, how do I want to do this literary analysis? I'm going to go learn a tidbit about public health and then start to bring those things together. So my capstone project was talking about um, human rights in the scope of like open source systems, um, which was a really fun project. I got to work with some really cool people. Um, and so kind of adding these layers. Um, before I got into tech, I was a dancer. Um, I danced competitively for 18 years. And so I like to joke around that like in my free time, I'm algorithmic puns. I know uh, it's okay. Um, I tap dance. Uh, I love kind of having my whole body in something. Um, and one of the things that uh, I still love about dance and I still love about music is um, trying to make those invisible noises, um, the patterns in sound um, physically manifest somehow in my body. Like there's a reason I'm moving this way. Um, and I think that's true of software too. Like you take these kind of abstract ideas floating around in people's head and how do I make that concrete in code? Um, so I, I think that that's, it parallels into software even though it's a little more artsy. Um, finding an adult dance community is kind of challenging. So that's why I'm gonna try to do aerial silks. We'll see what, what happens with that, um, but it'll be fun. Um, another fun fact you wouldn't know about me from like reading a LinkedIn profile, um, I made a connection with somebody who did work at LinkedIn at one, at one point, and she said, when you're meeting people for the first time, it's good to kind of say, you know, something that you wouldn't see on your resume. So my fun fact that you wouldn't know about me from Twitter, um, I learned how to sweat pipe recently. Uh, it has nothing to do with technology, but I'm a new homeowner. Uh, I know in this economy, uh, <laughs> uh, but it's a, it's a fun thing that I'm trying to do. It makes me feel like I, I actually own the house now that I've seen how it's built. Okay, so enough about me. We're not here to talk about that. Um, we're here to talk about functional programming um, and my journey into that. So to kick things off, um, I wanted to uh, kind of bring us back to how we came to functional programming as an industry. Um, Stack Overflow publishes some reports annually. Um, the one from last year, uh, we have kind of categorizations of languages that are loved versus dreaded. Um, and the top three from last year, um, two of these are like very purely fun functional programming languages, Elixir, Elixir and Closure. Um, and so I start thinking about like, there was a time when we were very procedural. We started giving up um, the indirect transfer of control. And that's kind of what got us to object oriented. And then when we realized object oriented, like maybe we really don't need assignment. We can kind of do away with that. And so these consecutive um, restrictions on ourselves kind of led us to this point as an industry. And so it's um, interesting and fascinating to me to think about how we've evolved over time. Um, that said, um, functional programming kind of has this uh, daunting, uh, steep learning curve at first. Uh, there are words that people say that I think can intimidate people like to no end. Um, and so when I'm talking about functional programming today, um, you won't hear me talk at length about lambda calculus. There will be a smidge bit of math. We'll get through it together. Um, I won't talk about currying. I won't talk about monoids. I won't talk about functors. Those are all important things. Um, I encourage you to go learn about them, watch a YouTube video, however you learn best. Um, but today I wanna to be focusing on pure functions and what side effects are, what that means for your code, um, set transformations, functions as first class citizens. Um, so these are some of the kind of key elements of functional programming that have made it click for me. Um, and it took a long time for me to get to that click. Uh, so we'll talk about the benefits of those patterns of thought as we go. All right. 
So speaking of those benefits, I'm going to try to kind of invert this. I'm going to give you the thing that I think you're going to get out of functional programming and then tell you how it's going to happen. Um, so we'll start with predictability. I think with functional programming, you get a lot of predictability out of your software. I'm going to start with uh, an example and a story. I'm looking specifically at Matt because he knows this one. Um, so I was learning a language called Go uh, for uh, work. Um, I'm going to walk through this example. You don't necessarily need to know how to code to follow along with this. Um, so this is written in Go. The first couple lines are basically saying I'm in the main package. I'm going to import some stuff so that I can print. Um, the first uh, couple lines there where I have a dump function is basically saying um, you're going to take a label and you're going to take a slice, which is basically a list of things, and print that out in some pretty format. Um, I'm going to use that just so I don't have to repeat that everywhere. Um, line nine is where we start to get into the good stuff. Um, I'm going to find a variable and it's going to be a list of strings. Those values are going to be the number one and two. Um, then I'm going to take that new variable that I created called count and I'm going to append to it. I'm going to call that variable demo. It's going to have the number three on the end of it. Stick with me. Now demo A um, is going to build on that new one. Um, it has the number four on it. And then demo B builds on the original demo as well. Um, and I'm going to tack on four and five. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, I'm going to use my dump function basically to print out the initial state. It looks something like this. So counts one, two, demos one, two, three, demo A through four, and then demo B through five. Um, so as I was learning about uh, Go and some of their built-in functions, um, I encountered this, um, hey, I want to update this value at a particular location in this list. So I said in this example, demo A, I want to change the value that you have at index one to be zero. Um, and after this change, um, I was kind of surprised by the results. Anybody want to guess at what happens? Do you want to guess? Brilliant. Um, I didn't expect that, way smarter than I am. Um, so count here was one and two, demo changed as well. Um, I thought that by changing demo A, I would not have influenced demo, but it totally did. And I was appalled, um, very confused by that. Um, I shouldn't have been because it was a pass by reference. So I was basically saying, refer back to demo. Okay, fine. I learned my lesson, I promise. Uh, so demo B, I'm going to change that list, that slice um, at index one. I'm going to change it to negative one. Any guesses on what happens here? What you totally didn't expect to have happen was only B changed. Freaking what? Um, I got so confused by that. I was like just kind of mind blown. Um, like a normal person would assume that demo B would have also changed demo if demo A changed demo. Um, and like, this isn't hard code. I didn't work on making this pretty. You can clearly tell that. Like, it, it's not, it's pretty straightforward. There's no loops. There's no if statements. Like, there's nothing snazzy going on here. Like, what is going on in memory? Um, fun fact, I actually showed this to my husband. <laughs> he uh, has a background in comp sci as well. And at one point he's like, is this our first fight? Like, are we fighting right now? Like, like I don't understand. Are we be yeah, no, we're not, we're fine. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so anyway, like when you get back to like, why does this state change the way that it does? And um, the real answer, if, you, if it's gonna bother you because it bothered me um, was there's a difference between how long the list is and its capacity to store. And if it exceeds the capacity, then it copies it instead of referencing it. Um, but you wouldn't know that by just looking at this code. Um, so when we get to pure functions, the concept here is that we want to reinforce the principle of least astonishment. Um, I don't want something that I'm doing in one spot to like spaghetti code another spot in memory. Um, so the output of my function should only be determined by the inputs to that function, and I don't want to have side effects. So here's the math. Um, I promise we'll get through this part. So functional. When you're thinking about functional programming, um, your x value, the thing that you give into it, um, should only influence the y value that you get out of it. When you're working in an impure setting, which tends to happen in imperative, there's ways that you can get around that, but tends to happen in imperative style, the math for that, like you'd never see in a textbook. Um, 
So f of x could be y if a is greater than two, but by the way, you really don't know what a is at any given point in time, like it's some global state, um, or it could be z if a is different. Um, and then kind of what we saw with uh, demo a influencing demo um, in that previous example, f of x equals y, but by the way, this other part of your state changed, like I just feels weird. Um, and so we kind of, as developers, when we're working in impure functions can kind of like gaslight ourselves. Like, I don't really know what to believe anymore. I don't know what state my program's in. Um, and it gets back to this quote, like doing the same thing over and over again, I should be able to expect the same result. Um, but sometimes we don't put ourselves in a position to do that. So I've rewritten this example um, in Groovy. Um, it's been a little while since I've done Groovy. So again, not the prettiest, but we'll get there. Um, same type of format, dump is just gonna do some pretty printing for me. I have an array um, of one and two. Demo is gonna build on that array, getting three, and then demo A is building on demo to add four, and then four and five. Um, initial state, exactly like you'd expect from the last time. When I change the first index of demo A to zero, I only affect demo A. Brilliant. Um, when I change demo B, I only affect demo B. I really love that. Um, you kind of say what you do and do what you say, nothing more. Um, so like there's uh, a small joy in like only affecting certain parts of state. Um, and there's really like, the stuff doesn't need to be complicated. Sometimes it is, um, but we start working in kind of this empowered ecosystem and functional programming. Like once you understand pure functions, you can start to apply it kind of across the board using some of the tools that already exist. Um, so to that end, there are frequently used collection methods. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about these. 80% um, of what I do in functional programming, probably, well, I would say even more than 80%, probably 95% of what I do in functional programming comes from these three methods. Every once in a while you sprinkle in a sort. Um, and so these methods are ways to operate on a set. Um, frequently we use lists. Um, and you're basically going to think about transforming that list um, over time instead of manipulating that, that list directly. Um, so this map method, um, map function, it's going to take a list of things and for every element in that list, it's going to say, apply some transformation. So in this case, if I have four green squares, if I pass it a function and say, tilt that square 45 degrees, um, you're gonna get three diamonds that are green. Um, same type of approach with filter, except for this function is gonna be a little bit more specific. Um, when I say I have a list of maybe a triangle, a circle and a triangle, I'm gonna pass it a function that returns kind of like a yay or nay, do I keep it or throw it out? Um, and when I um, am done applying that transformation, um, my list could shrink in size. It wasn't like I was manipulating those values directly. I was just saying, do I keep it or toss it? And then reduce. Um, reduce is probably the most confused method I've seen. Um, but it's basically a way to take a list of things and smash them all together into one, one unit at the end. Um, so the example I'll use here is if I have a circle, a rectangle and a circle, you could kind of warp those things together and create this like, three-dimensional cylinder shape if you wanted to. Um, so you take a list, smash it down to one value. Um, and there is the, like this giant ecosystem that exists. Um, there are functions upon functions upon functions um, that you could have operating on these lists and kind of chain them all together. Um, Alan Perlis has this quote, like it's better to have hundred functions operate on that one data structure, like those sets, those lists, than it is to have 10 functions operate on 10 data structures. And then you might only use the three of them. Hundreds of them exist and that's probably for our benefit. All right. So as an example, um, people who know me well know that I love reading and I'm also a big fan of Broadway. I told you I'm a dancer. Um, so I would like to know, um, we're gonna use these three methods that we just learned about MapReduce and filter. Um, I'm having a very non-exhaustive list of transactions that I put together for money that I spent on Broadway shows, tickets and books. Um, so as an example, I've uh, gone and seen the show Waitress. Um, so that's categorized as a Broadway show, it has a cost associated with it. Books, um, Adam Grant has a book called Think Again. Uh, so I bought that one, read that one, it's great. Um, same thing with domain driven design, uh, saw Hamilton and then a book that I haven't read that I need to engineering management for the rest of us. Um, so I have these things 
um, that I would like to classify and figure out like from these transactions, how much have I spent exactly on books? So with this transactions list, what I would do as a human, um, not necessarily what I would do as a computer at first, first glance, um, but what I would do as a human is say, get rid of the Broadway stuff. So I get down to these three elements that are just books, um, snazzy. The thing that I care about at this point um, isn't really the category. I know that I'm only looking at books. I don't really even care about the description. Um, I really just care about the cost. So I'm going to look at that particular property and try to get it into a numerical format that I can work with. Right now it's a string, which is kind of clunky for math. So I am going to um, look at how I would punch it into a calculator. I'm going to put a dollar sign in front of it. Um, so I'm going to get it down to this list of free prices, and then I'm going to add all those things up and get down to 113.47. It's a lot of money on books, but I love them. Um, so when I think about how I've approached that again as a human, we can start to translate that into code using some of those uh, functions that I've outlined. Um, so the first thing, I'm going to use a language called Elixir. Uh, uh, talk to Abby afterwards. Um, there's a set of transactions that I'm going to pass into this method that I called sum by category. And I'm also going to pass um, the name of the category that I care about. Right now I'm caring about books, but I could care about Broadway in the future and I want to be able to have that flexibility. So with these transactions, the next thing that I want to do with that list I said, as a human being, the thing that I cared about was getting rid of all the Broadway stuff. And I only care about books. So there's this function called filter. Um, it will take basically the thing that's on the left-hand side of it, I'm abbreviating that a little bit, um, and apply this function to it. So when I encounter a transaction, I want to make sure that the category property of that transaction matches the one that I passed in as a parameter. If it does, we keep it, which is how we got down to those three books. The next thing I cared about as a human um, was thinking about how to get to the cost. Um, so in this case, um, now that I have those three transactions, um, I care about looking at the cost property and I'm going to get rid of that dollar sign and then I'm going to convert it into um, a numerical value that I can start to do math with. Um, then once I have those three numbers, I'm going to reduce it down to one value that's sum. And so I take zero as my starting point for my running total. Um, and I'm going to basically accumulate all of the transactions together until I have the one value at the end. I'll do some snazzy rounding for you so it's not like weird floating point. Um, and then I get my answer, which is awesome. A uh, couple things that I really liked about this approach that became clear to me um, over time that I didn't appreciate early on. Um, the ability to read down the left-hand side is like a gift. Um, like it just means a lot to me to be able to kind of at a glance to see what's going on in my program um, and not have to like wade through nested, nested, nested if statements and for loops everywhere. Um, being able to just like you kind of get the, the, read, the skin version of that. It's nice. Um, the other thing that happened with uh, this code is you didn't see me go, OK, I'm going to basically create a loop. and um, that means I can only go through one of these at a time. I have to go in this order. Like I could have hypothetically started from the bottom and gone up. I could have started in the middle. I could have started anywhere. And so what we found with functional programming is that order doesn't really matter. Where imperative you say, here's my index. I'm gonna go through these sequentially. Functional, you could start in the middle if you wanted to. Um, you could even do multiple at the same time. If I think about this, um, if I was writing out this uh, transaction list, um, when I go through uh, processing each of those elements, like te technically I could like rip that paper in half, given it to somebody else and then come back and said, let's get together and compare answers or uh, join our results together. Um, so functional programming can kind of speed up your processing that way if you're allowing it to parallelize. Um, the other thing, there's a lot of other things, um, but one thing that stands out to me um, in functional programming is the ability to do really strong tester development. Um, so that Elixir uh, example, I am not strong enough in Elixir to probably write that on my own. Um, I needed a test to guide me. Um, so the transaction list that you see here should be very, very familiar. Um, and what I basically did was basically call that method with the transactions and the books list, and then I asserted that my answer was correct. Um, and I'm able to do that because 
Um, I don't care about external state. I'm not going to affect external state. Everything that I needed in that method, I can just provide to it. Um, and I have that return value to verify that that's something that I get back is actually valid. Um, Elixir has some cool tools to kind of see the progression of uh, set transformations along the way. Um, I wasn't working in an environment where I knew how to do that super well. So I um, opted to use this test as a way to say, what does my state look like after I did my filter? What does my state look like after I did my mapping? What does it look like after I reduce? And you can kind of progress through the transformations that way instead of having to kind of verify everything in one shot. Um, so again, with functional programming, like we have this really rich ecosystem of processes that we can follow that are already well-established, well-defined. Um, and we have functions that are built into a lot of our languages. Some wheels really don't need reinventing. Um, I don't need to go figure out how to join, join strings together. Like there's a function for that. Um, so stand on the shoulders of giants where they exist. Um, we have that suite of tools. We can parallelize. Um, and like I said earlier, test-driven development pairs really nicely with functional programming. Um, so with reduce and filter and map, we're passing in functions to each of those methods and transforming those lists um, as a result of applying that function. Um, that can lead to some really reduce, reduced code base size, um, which matters. Um, didn't matter to me as much when I was growing up, but it does now. Um, I'm going to use uh, an example uh, to kind of illustrate this point in how we might apply that in our own code instead of just relying on libraries that exist. Um, this problem comes from a developer at DMSI uh, where we're putting together kind of an internal dev developer conference. Um, and so this is the one that he came up with. Um, as a sample problem set, we're going to try to find um, our K nearest neighbors. So with DMSI being in the building materials industry, we want to be able to, without computer vision and AI and everything, um, score a piece of lumber. Um, and so here he was basically saying X's represent a piece of lumber that we're trying to score, the board that we're trying to score. I want to be able to see um, where uh, my neighbors are. So that way um, it's, it's likely that the boards that are next to me are very similar in score. Um, so I'm going to use this Pythagorean theorem, basically. I know it's more math, um, to identify the five nearest neighbors to me. And then I want to average those scores together. And then for the purposes of his puzzle, he wanted to add each of those scores together. So each X will have a score. You can add those together, multiply by 10, round to the nearest whole number. I'm going to do a little bit of hand waving here, um, but this is generally what the code looks like. Um, there's some terrain, um, map the board that you just saw. And I'm going to structure the input. It was originally given to me as a string, which is not fun to work with, a functional paradigm. Um, so I converted it into lists. Um, Beyond that, the next thing I did was try to find the locations of each of those red X's. Um, so that's what the find board locations does. Um, then I wanted to find all of the neighbors and figure out how far away they were from each of those X's respectively. So that's what this map is doing. Um, after that, I wanted to say, I only really care about the first five. Um, so take all the neighbors and only give me the first five that exist for each X. Um, and then, average those five distances for each X. So that's where you get the average distances of the closest neighbors. Um, after that, uh, as prescribed by the problem, we're gonna add those two together, multiply by 10, get and do some rounding. Um, I'm leaving out a lot of the algorithms and a lot of the math because it doesn't really matter. Um, the cool thing with this was I solved this problem in about 40 lines of JavaScript, um, which was probably could have done better, but it was fun. Um, so here's uh, kind of the, the, the output that I had. This, uh, this problem was based on a, uh, if you guys have heard of advent of code um, kind of approach. Um, if you haven't heard of advent of code, I highly encourage you to look at it. Um, and with those advent of code problems, there's usually two parts. You get one and you're like, man, I did it, crushed it. And then they, like they throw in some twist for part two. And so the twist for part two was, Okay, you thought you found the distance using the Pythagorean theorem, right? Um, instead, we're gonna have you calculate the distance using Manhattan distance. Um, Pythagorean theorem, if I have, you know, one, one length is three, one length is four, the hypotenuse is five, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, yes, okay. Um, Manhattan distance would be 
um, three plus set or three plus four. So my Manhattan distance would be seven. Basically, it's saying if I'm driving a taxi cab in Manhattan, I can't cut across diagonals in the block. Um, I have to go along the streets. Um, so I would have to travel a distance of seven instead of a distance of five. That's a little bit beside the point. Um, the other twist with this was instead of just averaging them, I want to weight the ones that are closest to me, closest to the X, um, more heavily. It's more likely that those will influence the result of the score. Um, so there's a little bit of change in the math there. Then the same type of rules apply, add them together, multiply by 10, round the answer. All right, so I looked at part one and I said, okay, so the structure of input, I still want that. Still want to find the board locations where my X's are. I still want to order the neighbors by location for each X so I can tell how far they are. Um, and I still care about the first five. Um, line six is looking a little weird because I don't really want to average the distances. I want to average the Manhattan distances. Um, but beyond that, like when I reduce, like add those up, multiply by 10, the rounding, all that stays pretty much the same. So I'm not beyond copy pasting. That's what I did. Um, create a new function and I called it average Manhattan distances. Um, so at one point, my editor looks something like this. Um, I had part one, which was averaging distances, and part two, which was averaging Manhattan distances. Um, and I think I would hate myself if I like let code like this go into production. It was like a practice problem. It was for funsies. Um, so I wasn't going to hate my life too much. But like a little bit of me also died. Um, so I refactored this. I took the opportunity to refactor. And what I noticed was that like there is kind of prescribed procedure um, that both of these problems follow. And the real difference is just about the strategy. Am I using just normal Euclidean algebra distance or am I using Manhattan distance? Um, and so when I refactored, it started to look something like this. Not saying that this is perfect. There's probably ways we could pick this apart too. Um, but this is where I ended up. There's this new method called score with strategy that outlines the procedure that I want to follow, everything that stayed the same between part one and part two. And then I was able to basically pass in a reference to average distances and average Manhattan distances so that I could toggle basically which approach I wanted to take. Um, so that code became a lot more concise. It was clear to me what was different between part one and part two. Um, and then just in terms of the number of lines of code, um, Git told me that there were six additions, nine deletions. Okay, so like really net negative three, um, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but in a 21 line program, like that kind of is. Um, it's seven, seventh of the program. Um, and if you think about, if you have a production issue, um, being able to just like kind of wipe out a seventh of your software, like no the problem's not gonna exist there because it doesn't exist, um, can be pretty impactful. Um, the reason we can do this is because of higher order functions. Um, MapReduce filter have similar approaches, um, but being able to take functions as arguments to methods, um, and the flip side of that is you can also return functions from functions, um, allows you to kind of see at a glance what's different, how you organize your code, and to reduce the code base size in general. Um, reducing that code base size, kind of already alluded to this, is super significant um, in terms of like maintainability. Um, of your software. I also think it has a lot to do with cognition. Um, I mentioned my husband is uh, a little bit familiar with programming. He's also a neuroscientist. Um, so we have fun conversations about psychology. Um, pretty sure you can like summon him if you say amygdala three times fast. Um, he's cool. And so he would probably have a lot to say about this. Um, <laughs> this is so, so fun. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Winter. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Dr. Winter is uh, my functional programming teacher. Um, I had kind of grown up doing Java at uh, UNO and uh, was very familiar with the imperative style. Um, got into a little bit of C and somehow made it to senior year without ever having touched functional code. Um, so this was uh, like if I could put a scrapbook together, this would have a special place in it. This was my very first functional programming problem. Um, so. Uh, again, we were familiar with Java, um, but we were writing in a language called uh, SML, uh, standard ML. And so the uh, method that we were tasked with writing is called alternate. It's going to take two lists. They have the same length. 
Um, and you basically want to take the first element from one list, the first element from another list, and kind of alternate until you get to um, this end result. So um, as an example, if I have a list one, three, five, and a list two, four, six, my result should be one, two, three, four, five, six. So every fiber of my being, <laughs> uh, when I was coming from Java, just wanted to write the imperative style. Um, and so I was like, okay, Lauren, like just, you can write that, it'll be fine. Just get it out of your system. So I, <laughs> I wrote this, um, at the time it was in Java, I'm putting it in JavaScript for right now um, for a reason that I'll discuss later. Uh, but this is kind of what my alternate method would have looked like. Um, I have a list A and a list B. Um, I'm gonna probably calculate some, you know, what is the double of that? So that way I can kind of get another list established. Um, I'll create that intermediate variable called list C that's gonna hold the results. Um, and then I'll walk through uh, until I get to the end result. Um, if it's divisible by two evenly, uh, I want to pull from the first list. If it's divisible by two unevenly or not divisible by two, um, I want to pull from the other list and kind of accumulate my result, marking it in state. So um, my brain started going, okay, here's the initial state. Um, I have list A, list B, my total length is six. Let's see, looks something like this. Here's I is set to zero. So by the first time I'm through the loop, um, because zero is divisible by two evenly, I pulled the number one from list A, put it in list C, um, and then I at the end gets incremented. So I'm at the end of that loop. Same type of thing happened the next iteration. I pulled two though from list B, put it in list C, I incremented, and then repeat. So A, uh, uh, list A, I pulled three from there and pulled it down into list C, three, okay, fast forward, you get the point. Um, here's kind of what the end state looks like. Um, when I finally got over like that itch of wanting to control my program and instead let my thoughts kind of manifest themselves, um, I ended up with something uh, in SML, it was literally two lines. Um, it's pretty cool, uh, pretty cool to see. Um, I wrote a similar-ish example in JavaScript. So we have like ease of comparison right now. Um, so I'm cheating a little bit too. So alternate, it's gonna take two lists, A and B. Um, and then I'm gonna basically give you kind of this like convenience function to establish an accumulator. Um, so I'm gonna pass in an empty list. And um, so when I get to that alternate recur method, um, I have A and B. But I know that like if I've reached the end of A, there's nothing left in that list for me. Um, I just wanna return the thing that I've accumulated thus far. It might not have anything in it ever um, if A is empty to begin with. Um, but when I've reached that case, I know I'm done. Otherwise, um, I'm gonna kind of start at the bottom here. Um, list C, I wanna tack on the first element that's in list A, and then I wanna tack on the, the first element that's in list B. Um, and then beyond that, um, where you see the slices, that's basically saying move to the next element in list A and list B. Um, so when I had one, three, five, A, the next time I hit that recurring function is gonna say three, five. The visual for that is here. Um, so the first time alternate has one, two, three, or one, three, five, two, four, six. Um, I'm saying glue these two together. Um, so the thing that you see on the left is going to be my new list C. And then, um, the rest is passed to the next alternate method. So I have three, five coming through and four, six. Same type of thing happens. I tack on the first one of each list and then alternate happens with five and six until I get this accumulated value of one, two, three, four, five, six and alternate is empty. I know I've reached my base case there. So um, the things that stand out to me as I was thinking about this example and reflecting on like how long ago that class was for me, um, knowing that assignment was not needed to accomplish that task uh, was a big thing for me to try to like kind of overcome that hurdle. Um, learning how to draw steps in the process instead of like, here's the state at this point in time. I didn't have to worry <laughs> if things were crashing. Like I just, I just kind of knew where I was. That function was going to complete. Um, start to get to like how I talk about programming is how I'm writing my code, which was awesome. Um, also, the problem size shrinks as you approach the base case. Um, and we could all take some life advice from functional programming. If you can't change the problem, change your attitude. Um, 
you can't change the problem, uh, or if you can't change the input, change the problem, get closer to the base case. Um, and then this last one, uh, there's a tool called SonarCube uh, that does some work in terms of helping people understand code quality. Uh, there's security parts to it, there's maintainability, there's reliability, um, but some of my most favorite metrics that come out of SonarCube are the cyclomatic complexity and the cognitive complexity. And uh, the reason that I wrote this example in JavaScript this time was so that we could get an honest comparison. Um, so cyclomatic complexity, uh, for those who are unfamiliar, is basically how many branches um, do I have through my code? When I was working on this imperative style one, my sonar scan basically gave me a result of three, whatever unit that means. Um, there's three possible paths. The functional version of this um, also gave me three. Cool, no big deal. Um, and this is kind of where I got um, probably a little feistier than I had the right to be um, when I was in my undergrad. Like a little bit of me was like, okay, it, but it works. Like, so like really who cares? Um, it doesn't really matter what my code looks like. It does the thing it's supposed to do. Um, and I'm glad I was challenged on that. So cognitive complexity then um, is a measure that SonarCube has about like how hard you have to think about your code. When I'm working with imperative, um, it was three, kind of no surprise because you're telling the machine exactly what you want to have happen. Um, and this is where like the mic dropped for me, like functional is a whole one. Um, like if I can reduce the amount of information I have to hold in my head at any given point in time by a factor of three, like you imagine what else that frees you up to do. It's good stuff. So the shift towards functional programming, um, there's kind of some landmarks, um, some milestones um, that help guide me in that path. Um, and so there's like warning signs that I think about when you're trying to approach something from what used to be imperative and working towards functional. So some of these code smells that kind of come up. If you see yourself starting to define a variable, um, just hands away from the keyboard for a sec. Like think about um, if there's a different way to do that. Um, assignment isn't allowed. In functional programming, they allow pattern matching, which is different. So even though you see an equal sign, it might not mean what you think it means. Um, but those intermediate values, if they can be avoided, um, it's, it's a kind of a warning sign that you, you might be tending towards imperative. Um, and then thinking about those set transformations, um, anytime you start to like reach for a loop of your favorite variety, um, start thinking about what collection methods exist. Can I use a map filter, reduce? Something like that probably already exists for the thing that I need to solve. Um, let somebody else solve those problems. Um, just tell it the thing you need it to do, not how to do it. Um, same type of thing with inde indexing. Um, if you care about those intermediate variables, you might care about what index you are in the loop. Um, and you start to restrict yourself to single threading, whereas you could have divided that work um, in a functional style. TDD will be your friend in terms of those set transformations, figuring out how to um, Think about those transformations over time. If you notice yourself whiteboarding and you start scribbling uh, numbers out or erasing things, um, again, reevaluate. Um, and then finally, um, if you notice, like me, you weren't against copy pasting originally, uh, take the beat to like, refactor, think about how you can extract those differences. Um, so back to this like layered approach to technology and what that means to me um, when I think about kind of what I said as a practice leader, like what I think about code and I think about humans, um, these functional programming code smells that I'm calling them are really only like this external sign of how you're thinking. Like it's it's the, the invisible made visible. And so there are things that happen on the inside of a person going through this transformation from imperative to functional. And when you're kind of venturing into this like unknown territory, like things can be a little daunting takes time to rewire your brain to think this way. Um, that code shape changes. You go from uh, 21 lines of code to 18 because something in your brain changed a little bit too. Um, and coding, I think is kind of special in some ways. Like I know that there's um, an element of pride and uh, like because code is kind of a representation of what happens internally in your brain, like people can get really attached to it. Um, and so there's this quote from psychology of computer programming, like it's kind of an extension of yourself. 
um, ego feels like a strong word and I don't think he means it negatively, but it becomes like part of your personality. Like there's this socio-technical element of programming. And so shifting the, the person um, will have technical implications, but um, it's important to kind of keep that in mind. Um, the best thing that I've seen, <laughs> like for me, going through um, that class at school was really uh, kind of a milestone for me. Um, and then being able to start to apply some of those things at work was really nice. Um, I had a very strong mentor at the time who was a fan of functional programming, um, who provided me the chance to go, okay, you're tending towards imperative again. <laughs> Bring it back, Lauren, um, and kind of pair with me along the way. Um, we had a lot of really good conversations, like here are the warning signs, here's where I'm noticing, you're kind of drifting. Um, so find a buddy to pair a program with um, if you're working on this, keep, keep each other in check. Um, all right, interested in learning more because everybody's always interested in learning more. Um, dig into your favorite collection methods um, and your language of choice. Um, if you're interested in learning more about functional programming in general, um, there's an Omaha Elixir Mixer meetup um, where we talk specifically about Elixir with some cool people in that community. Um, and then, like I said earlier, find a pair programming buddy to uh, challenge you to think functionally. Um, beyond the mentorship that I had in school and at work, um, there's this book called Little Schemer. I don't know if anybody's done it before, but it's super fun. Um, I sat with uh, a dev friend of mine we pretty consistently did it for a couple hours each week. Um, they have kind of the Socratic method of like, you know, what is a list? And you, you kind of discover it along the way. Um, it was a really fun challenge for us. You get some like pretty hilarious quotes that like, I don't think I could replicate on the spot if I tried. Um, so I would encourage you to like try to try working through those problems with a team um, or a subset of people if you're interested. Uh, Managing Transitions is another really important book to me right now. Um, it talks about the kind of the letting go uh, before you can gain something really awesome um, and what that process is like. So for me, when I was thinking about like, what are the things that I had to let go of in functional or uh, in imperative style, it was all those familiar patterns. It was the way of thinking. And I had to kind of go, okay, I'm going to float here. I don't really know what I'm doing. I don't know how to navigate these docs um, in order to finally get to that point where it's like, this is just how my brain works. Um, and I can't think any other way now. Um, so that book reflecting back on that, knowing that I've had this journey behind me um, is kind of cool. And then uh, the last one that I would recommend if you're interested in like kind of the blend of people in tech, um, the programmer's brain, husband would probably recommend that one too, talks a lot about cognition. Like what am I able to hold in my head at any given point in time? Um, I'm only partway through it, but if you want a book club buddy, I'd be interested in that. Cool, that's what I got.